Well, let's do it. Shall we do another? Yeah. Great. This is Out of the Dark, an audio series about Dark Hall, a theater built in 1929 in Regina, Saskatchewan. In this series, we're exploring Dark Hall by hearing the stories of people who have been touched by this historic performance space. I'm your host, Paul Deshane. Episode 6, The Fazioli. In 2014, Dr. Roberta McKay and Mr. Elmer Brenner gifted a world-class grand piano to the University of Regina's Conservatory of Performing Arts. It had been crafted by pianist and engineer Paolo Fazioli. McKay and Brenner actually traveled to the Fazioli workshop in northern Italy to select the instrument with the help of pianist Angela Hewitt. Dark Hall became the home of the Fazioli piano, and in many ways, the donation of this instrument kicked off the whole process that led to the restoration of the College Avenue campus and Dark Hall. Jamie Crowser was a piano student at the University of Regina when the Fazioli arrived, and she wrote a short story about her experience playing it. I've woven Jamie's reading of her story throughout this episode of Out of the Dark, and along with it, I have included her performance of the Scriabin pieces she mentions. Here's Jamie Crowser. the first in my class to play the Fazioli. Our meeting occurred in the dead of the semester, when papers were due and final exams crept upon us. My music professor held a special master class, inviting his students to Dark Hall to play the new Fazioli piano. Between historic brick walls and lush red stage curtains, I was about to experience Fazioli's charm. Brought to the small prairie city of Regina, Saskatchewan, the Fazioli Concert Grand Piano had been gifted to Dark Hall by dedicated local art supporters, Dr. Roberta McKay and Mr. Elmer Brenner. It was thanks to their generosity that I was being given this wonderful opportunity. As only a second year piano student at the University of Regina, I felt incredibly lucky to have a chance to play such a rare instrument. She had traveled all the way from Italy and she was finally home handmade across 3,000 hours, and one of only 140 pianos built that year, she was a jewel. And now, she was ours. Arranged in one row on collapsible chairs, I sat on the stage with my classmates, hands ringing and waiting until my time finally arrived. Although I'd had Scriabin's preludes memorized for weeks, I had brought the book of scores with me to make notes of sections and concepts to practice after my performance. With a deep breath, I rose, setting the score aside on my chair, open to preludes number 9 and 10 with number 14 bookmarked behind them. These were the three pieces I'd been practicing and falling in love with all semester. I approached the Fazioli, smiling in awe but as if in greeting, and she gleamed back at me. After taking care to adjust the piano bench until it felt right, I took a seat, feeling the soft cushion supporting me as my legs moved into a stable but flexible position. The bench dug into my thighs and the adrenaline coursed through my body. I was grateful that I had made it today. I inhaled, closed my eyes, and prepared myself, remembering the imagery that David and I had been conjuring in our lessons. The sea, the calm before the storm, ripples radiating out from a single drop of water growing larger and larger, and I thought of October. When I was ready, I let the energy flow from my feet grounded on the floor to my arms and down into my fingers as I raised my hands and brought my thumb down to sink into C-sharp. The sound that emerged from the open piano lid in that one instant was heavenly, richer and fuller and brighter than anything I'd heard before. It sang, enveloping me in warmth. The air sparkled, alive. I imagined this is what magic might sound like. Whoa, I exclaimed, my voice cracking as I yanked my hands away from the keys in shock. One single note was all I needed to understand. Thank you. 
On a cold winter day, I met with Dr. Roberta McKay and Elmer Brenner at McKay's office on College Avenue. If you look to the left at the front window of her waiting room, you can just see Dark Hall through the trees. Why did you want to gift a fazioli to Dark Hall? Like, why a piano? Why this particular piano? Well, um, we were approached by David McIntyre, Christine van der Kooy, another um, pianist, and um, Jocelyn. Jocelyn. Sorry, I haven't got the last name. But she's not a pianist, but is interested in music. Right. And their uh, pitch to us was that Regina does not have a world class piano. And so we had meetings, and finally David uh, said that the Fascioli would be the world class piano. And um, then the question came is, uh, how are we going to pay for this? <laughs> and uh, after a while, Elmer and I just said, we'll buy it and we'll gift it to the university. So that's how it came about. And part of the discussion was that you realized very quickly that the idea wasn't strong enough to catch Joe Public's attention. And the only way it was going to come here is if we did something. And that's when the decision happened. Yeah. This isn't the only uh, contribution you've made to that whole restoration across the street. You guys are on the, you're on the committee. That, we were in, on the original committee. Yeah. yeah. Why do you feel that it's so important to, to do this restoration of Dark Hall in the conservatory? Well, I grew up here. My piano teacher had her studio in the basement of Dark Hall, and I played my recitals on, this, on the stage. So, growing up, that was the cultural center of Regina. And uh, so I, I feel really uh, committed to that building, and it's a beautiful building, yeah. the acoustics are fantastic, and uh, we don't have anything that size in Regina, you know, we have connects is the big thing. And, well, there are, there's Holy Rosary Cathedral and Knox Matt and, you know, they, they are small spaces, but this is a real concert hall. And I think the other part of that decision was when we realized that the, the project was going to be part of the restoration of the, the actual campus building, you know, like the, west end of it you know it was all going to be part and parcel that it made sense like like uh, if it was simply dark hall it might have had a different uh, bit of sway but it was a whole project it, it just made sense to do it uh, when you guys decided to make this decision to get the piano you said you went to italy we did that's amazing what was that trip like oh amazing yeah <laughs> uh, the factory, first of all, Mr. Fascioli is a pianist. He's trained as an engineer. And he, his family built fine furniture. So he got a group of people together who had all the skills they needed. And he said, I'm going to build the best piano in the world. And um, he started off in the old factory. and. He has a beautiful new uh, place with a 250-seat uh, concert hall, all the bells and whistles, basically. He, uh, and he did build a world-class piano. And th this um, factory is in the town of uh, Sashili. Okay. It's a little tiny town, about 70 kilometers north of Venice. So we went there, and Mr. Fascioli was like, treated as like royalty. He sent a driver with a car to, to pick us up at the airport and take us to Sicily. We went and we had a tour of the factory, and we saw every part of how these pianos are made. It's just unbelievable, the, the hours of work that go yeah. into making one piano. And then when they have the piano made, they number it. So ours is 1974. <laughs> and that's how many they'd made up to that point. And right. I think he'd been in business about 30 years by then. We do have 
photos that we took while we were in the factory so you can see what the building process was like and and you know different things about it that were just phenomenal like when the piano is built when it's put together and the strings are in place and everything's in place they move it into a little room and the little room has an automatic hammer system so it sits there and it goes boom 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 for i forget how many hours 12, 12 hours, hours. Yeah. and then they take the piano out and if it's in tune it's ready for sale if it isn't it goes retuned rejigged back in boom 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 for another 12. it's 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 phenomenal it just uh, uh, it was it's such an experience, and, yeah. and as Roberta said, they treated us like royalty. I mean, got to have dinner with Angela Hewitt and with Mr. Fazioli and his, his friends and family, and yeah. and it, so it was, uh, yeah, quite an experience. Quite nice. an experience. I'm curious, can you guys hear the difference between like a Yamaha and one of Fazioli? <laughs> Not necessarily that way, but when Angela Hute was trying the pianos yeah. and we were listening carefully, and as a matter of fact, again, I have a bit of footage of that, but she said, no, not, you know, like, come on, you know, this is my life kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but we have a bit, but you could tell the difference in the pianos that she was trying right. um, if you really listened. Yeah. But, I mean... <laughs> How, how critical? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, most people who play the fascioli say it kind of plays itself, that your touch is so light and, yeah, it's a pretty exciting instrument. So you guys did this in 2014? Or 13? Is it? <laughs> no, wait. Just track was, of time. Uh, yeah. We went in December 2012, and then we had to have a piano garage built to provide uh, the right heat and humidity. So that got done by the end of August. Right. And the factory is closed in August. So as soon as it opened up, we phoned and said, OK, we can uh, take the piano now. And uh, Mr. Fascioli, most other companies, Yamaha, you name it, they ship them on the ocean. Not Mr. Fascioli, no. he. He flies it in a plane that is heat and humidity yeah. controlled. Really? Yeah. And then that plane is so big, it could have landed here, but it can't take off from here. So they had to go to Calgary, yeah. and then they had to get a transport truck, heat and humidity controlled, to bring it here. It, oh, it was in a box. Yeah. And uh, he... Uh, when they brought it here, the piano movers, um, the, they didn't expect it to be as heavy as it is. So they take this box out of the thing and they drop it. Oh my God. And Only six what, inches. Sure. Pardon by you know, and that's yeah. what Elmer says. Immediately he phoned Manuel, the man we bought it from in Vancouver, and he said, oh, it'll be fine. So they take it, they take the box off, David McIntyre sits down and plays it. It is perfectly in tune after all that. How do you guys feel now that it's here and like, like we're like weeks away from everything opening up again? Well, that's the problem, isn't it? But yeah. hopefully some music students are playing it. It's in the college building. And then in Dark Hall, they've built a room for the, the piano garage. And it, when you say, how do you feel like it's it's like at the beginning, you wanted, we, we definitely wanted it there right now, you know, do whatever, get it in. Yeah. And then you realize that no, that wasn't going to happen. So it's like cool your jets and just wait and wait and wait. And it's taken this long. But I guess from my point of view, I don't know, I can't speak for Roberta, but it's it's almost become a... It'll happen when it happens. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah, well, you, you couldn't predict what's happening to this us now. So, no kidding. <laughs> but we did. I mean, we got to we got to see it played a few times. And when Roberta's mom passed away, 
we had a um, memorial celebration of life, whatever, at our call. Oh, nice. The university said, yes, go ahead. And the Patioli was out there. David McIntyre and Christine Van Der Kooi and your niece, or, well, your niece and her children yeah, they, got to play it a little bit, you know, just little simple tunes and everything else. But it was there and it was being used. So we feel privileged that that aspect of it, that we were able to, to have that. You know, this is apropos of nothing, I think, in some ways. But when, uh, because we were part of the, the committees and one thing or another, when they were demolishing uh, parts of that that uh, old building, we were. I asked them if they would, if I could have the uh, the marble steps that were at the back because they were not uh, terribly worn like the ones in the front were. And they said, "Oh yeah, they're yours. Go ahead and take them." So in the meantime, I took them. In the meantime, by uh, Dr. Timmins. Uh, commissioned me to do a sculpture for the university nice. and it's there at the building we took the stairs the steps rather the marble steps and we put them all together in a solid block right and then I did the sculpture on the solid block of marble so it's now at the back of the university it's at the of the really? college avenue campus there yes oh it's I just sitting know about there. this so it, it's it's there and I am so proud of it, and it was blessed by the First Nations elders, and it was the ceremony happened. It was it, it, a once in a lifetime experience, for sure. Earlier on that bright fall day, wedged between the trees, Dark Hall towered above me. The crisp autumn air froze my throat. Dead leaves, fire smoke, and raw dirt. It smelled like death and renewal all at the same time. I stood thinking of how October is the saddest month. A piece I once learned by Tchaikovsky called October, Autumn Song, played through my mind, capturing the feeling perfectly. The melody sounds like longing. Heartbreaking, melancholy notes stretch over the upper staff, perpetuated by low, dismal chords, always ebbing and flowing, building and falling. It is like trying to swim with bricks tied to your feet. You pull yourself forward, everything weighing you down, dragging behind you, while your heart desperately yearns to be free. October is like that for me. It had been difficult to get out of the house that day to make the chilly walk across Wascana Lake to Dark Hall. My heart had skipped a beat, and my cheeks flushed with glee when my professor, David, told me that our next master class would be in Dark Hall. But as excited as I was to play the Fazioli, I'd been suffering from the autumn blues. Questions about the meaning of life and my purpose in it had been swirling round my head. Performance anxiety and imposter syndrome had latched onto my heart and squeezed tightly, screaming over and over, you're not good enough, you're not worthy. The fear was especially strong that day. Who was I to be playing one of the greatest pianos ever built in the city's most historic concert hall? I was no Angela Hewitt, nor Christine Van Der Kooi or David McIntyre, nor even the best pianist in the class. I admit, I didn't feel like I belonged. Shaking the cold and the thoughts away, I pulled open the middle of the three heavy wooden doors, leaving the clear blue skies and distant geese calls behind, and emerged into something reminiscent of a castle or a grand European opera house. The atmosphere instantly changed once inside, seeming cozy and welcoming. The royal red of the carpets, seats, and curtains stood out in contrast against the hall's white wooden walls, highlighted by the golden-colored pipe organ that stood guard grandly in the two upper corners on either side of the stage. The pipes are strictly decorative and made of plaster, adding nothing to the sound of the hidden Cassavant organ, but they sure looked magnificent. Streams of light shone in through the windows, bringing the room to life with a warm golden glow. Inside the hall, it smelled so different than the world outside like wood and paper and history. I imagined a full audience milling about in anticipation and speaking in hushed whispers, waiting for the start of a great performance. I began to cross slowly towards the right aisle where the red carpet was laid out for me as if I were someone famous and important. My footsteps echoed against the towering walls and the large open ceiling, and I stepped lighter and breathed softer as if to minimize the sound. I exhaled in relief when I made it to the softer carpet. 
One feels they need to whisper in a building as old and magnificent as this, so as not to disturb the ghosts within its walls. My fellow classmates were congregating by the stage. We exchanged greetings, and after some preliminary chit-chat about how studying for our midterm exams was going, stressful, we all agreed, and who all went to the choral concert last weekend, wasn't the soloist impressive? David welcomed us to the master class. With a gentle smile and hands clasped in front of him, he beckoned us to follow him to the back of the stage. It was back there that the Fazioli lived when she was not making music. Avoiding the tight corners of her temperature-controlled house, David, myself, and another classmate rolled her out slowly and carefully. My hands hesitantly touched the soft covering. Once in position, David pulled the cover back, and suddenly there she was. Stark white wooden keys standing out against jet black lacquered ones. As shiny as glass, I could see the reflection of five eager faces staring in wonder as if the piano was a mirror of another world. David spent the next few minutes introducing us to the Fazioli. I devoured the information as if it was fuel for art. I learned that everything about the Fazioli was the result of years of research and tests upon tests to hone in on the best sound. Originally developed in the 1980s by Paolo Fazioli, an engineer and pianist from Rome, Fazioli pianos were uniquely constructed to offer a greater range of dynamics and colors than the average instrument, and in comparable power. The piano was specifically chosen for its evenness of tone from the lowest, deepest bass notes to the clearest, brightest soprano notes, which allowed for natural flow between the two without loss of strength in the higher register. And then there was the heart of the piano, the soundboard, where the vibrations created by the strings would be converted into sound waves that reached our ears as music. Forged from high-quality spruce trees found in the Italian Eastern Alps, the soundboard was built from the same trees that Antonio Stradivari used for his famed Stradivarius violins, carefully shaped and placed inside the body of the piano to create the richest tones. The exterior of the piano was as magnificent as the inside, with many parts, including the hinges, covered in 18 karat gold that would not oxidize and fade like the brass pieces on other pianos. She was absolutely, exquisitely beautiful and I was mesmerized. So when it came time to play, and David asked who would like to go first, my hand shot into the air like a firework. Moments later, I took my seat with Fazioli. So struck by my first wondrous note, I stopped abruptly to relish in it and recollect myself. My classmates chuckled, but I was too focused to fully notice. Rolling my shoulders, I prepared myself to begin again. As the giant stage lights beat down on me, I felt my face flush and moisture form on my palms. My breathing quickened, my pulse raced, and my heart beat loudly and hollowly in my chest, all the familiar signs of anxiety. But as my wise choir professor, Dominic Gregorio, once told me, musicians need a little bit of nervousness or the performance will be flat. So you can let the nerves sit and paralyze you, or you can turn them into energy and use it to fuel your performance. Remembering his advice, I noticed a parallel in the words from a children's book I once read. You cannot be happy unless you are sad sometimes. Waves and ripples and October. I began to play. My hands flowed over the keys, drifting from E major to C sharp minor and back again, sinking deep into chords and floating through arpeggios. The notes, effortlessly emerging from the piano's spruce soundboard, circled up to the ceiling and filled the entire theatre to the brim. All I saw were the shadows of my hands flitting across the black and white keys, save for the brief moments I closed my eyes and saw everything. In my own little world, nothing else existed but myself, Fazioli, and the walls of Dark Hall. The notes in the higher register were the most impressive. Clear and strong, they rang out as my fingers danced in little circles, flirting with the dotted rhythms. But the richness and the fullness of the lower tones was breathtaking too. The notes came alive and embraced me, transporting me to another plane. As I moved deeper and deeper into the piece, I felt the weight of the last few weeks lifting off of me. I was carried away by the notes of the song. Stress evaporated from my arms and fingers, floating across the stage and up to the rafters. I felt myself growing lighter and lighter, relaxing and leaning back as the music became more uplifting and melodic. Any remaining tension in my body melted through my fingertips and was absorbed by the keys, and I let Fazioli take away the winter blues that had plagued me every October. It was bliss, the most alive I'd felt in weeks, and I was free to explore this innocent, magical feeling through the music. 
And then suddenly, everything changed. The 14th prelude ushered in strong, heavy chords, crashing like waves against the rocks, building in momentum with every bar of the music. My brow furrowed as I honed in on this intensified anguish. I imagined myself standing at the edge of a dam, arms spread open wide, one lone body attempting to hold the roaring water back. I felt as if I had been doing this all my life. Give even a little, and there is a steep drop waiting beneath me. Lean in too much, and I will be swept away. One must always balance. The music grew and grew, my hands expanding outwards to use a greater area of the keyboard. My entire body rocked back and forth, my heels slightly lifting off the ground as I pushed onwards. Pressing into the keys with all my strength, I heard the full color of the fazioli whirling around me, the sound deep and dark and threatening to burst through the floorboards beneath me. And then, with a crescendo and a large chord at the climax, the dam broke and water came rushing through, pushing me off the edge and sending me plunging into the sea. The waves and the music roared together, overpowering everything else. Chord progressions formed a current that swept me away, carrying me through wave after wave, but I didn't struggle. I let the music overcome me. Together with Fazioli, we relished in the despair and the anger and the uncertainty, giving ourselves over to it, with the comfort that we were strong enough to swim in the deepness of the ocean and yet always rise again to float above the waves like we had moments before. And that's what I did, sitting with Fazioli, holding back the tears as my eyes closed and my body swayed in rubato to the anguished chords and the soaring long notes, feeling them both equally, loving them both equally, and existing somewhere in between, learning how to be both happy and sad in time. The notes slowly became fewer and farther between, and I knew the piece was ending soon, as was my time with Fazioli. When the last note sounded and the final tendrils of the prelude swirled around me, I waited a moment, still like autumn, listening to them ringing in the vastness of the theatre. When my hands lifted from the keys, they were heavy, tired but energized from use. My mind was clear and rejuvenated after only a brief few moments with the Fazioli. Something had been released, set free. I nodded a thanks to Fazioli and rose from the piano bench. David McIntyre is a composer and pianist who's been based in Regina since 1976. He's taught music at the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan, and has been a composer in residence with the Regina Symphony Orchestra. And he was one of a small group of musicians and music enthusiasts who came together to bring a world-class piano to Regina. You were instrumental in bringing the Fazioli to Regina. Why did you want to bring a Fazioli to Regina? Uh, as, as a pianist who has played in most of the venues in the city, I uh, am, am acutely aware of the quality of pianos in different places and the flexibility to, uh, to be able to perform music that includes piano, either solo or, or with, with other uh, players. Um, and... Uh, it, it just seemed to me we did not have a space there, there, there weren't there weren't enough great instruments in the city and I ended up thinking that most of the time the best instruments I play on are the ones here yes. at, at my home uh, they're, they're both Yamahas uh, but they're they're good instruments and uh, you, you know, you, as a performer, you get excited about practicing something. It sounds wonderful. Then you go to an inferior instrument and, and have to wrestle with that. But that's the life of a pianist. A pianist always makes friends with the instrument that you're playing. And um, sometimes it's more of a struggle to do that than others. But that, that's the reason I thought it would be great to have a really world-class instrument that wasn't locked up at the center of the arts. 
you know, where there, there are two, an older and a newer Steinway, and which are, are certainly decent instruments, you know. And uh, the university had some aging instruments uh, uh, at the time. And, uh, and I just thought, we really need a great instrument, you know, in this city. And then I started percolating the idea in my mind, and I started talking with a few musician friends. And uh, uh, we decided to form a committee for the express purpose of getting a concert grand somewhere in the city. You know, of course, it's, it's not something you can easily uh, hide away from where you have to have a major space for it, uh, an instrument of that size. So uh, Dark Hall had come to our, our mind very early on as probably being the likely place where something like that might happen. But it was not even, that wasn't confirmed. We didn't confirm that before we, we um, got the piano. Uh, and moved ahead with this project. But, uh, yeah, so that was the first part. The, the first, it, it was born out of the frustration of, of not having a, a really superior instrument to play. A superior instruments are, are a dream for a pianist. For any musician, a great instrument makes a huge difference. And uh, you just discover things about music that you, you wouldn't otherwise know if you didn't or didn't have the experience of being able to play on that, you, to, to know what is possible with a very fine instrument. So we have that in the Fazioli. Uh, we discussed, of course, different pianos. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't um, bingo that we'd like to order a Fazioli. It was just uh, with a, a great instrument, whether that be a Yamaha, Steinway, Beckstein, uh, Busendorfer, all of these were considered. And... Um, uh, the various people that we had on our committee um, had, of course, among us, we'd all had experience with all these instruments. And uh, I had, um, my second piano sonata was written for Angela Hewitt uh, back in 2000. And she premiered it in Saskatoon uh, at that time. And uh, I had known her through concerts, her visiting concerts here in the province before. And... Uh, uh, and I knew she was a, a Fazioli enthusiast, and and actually one of her, uh, one of the places where she has a home in Italy is not far from the Fazioli factory, and she knew Mr. Fazioli, of course, personally, and uh, and had uh, had her her own piano, and uh, so she was she was of course very enthusiastic about Fazioli's, and so I thought, and she had also played at Dark Hall, and so I phone I, I emailed her and asked her. If, um, if she might think that a Fazioli would be a suitable instrument for Dark Hall, and if she would have time, some time, to choose an instrument for us, basically. Uh, I mean, it's a long ways away, and, uh, you know, I, I suppose one of us could have gone to the factory, uh, but that's, uh, you know, again, another huge expense and all that. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself because um, we first of all we're, we were uh, the the first the major purpose of the committee was to raise money to get such an instrument because we don't just say we'd like one and and order it you know we have yeah. to have to be able to finance it yeah. so um, uh, one day I was uh, in, in the parking lot outside Mackenzie Art Gallery uh, talking to Roberta and Elmer Mackay after a, after a, a, a dramatic dramatic. Uh, concert or program and Roberta asked me so what's new and I said well I'm working with with this committee on the uh, on getting a new piano for the city and I explained to her much as I just told you yeah. why and she got very excited about it uh, in her quiet way and uh, said you know I, I wouldn't mind being a part of that committee and I thought oh well that's lovely great so so we uh, included her in the uh, in the committee, uh, in my mind, anyways, right away. But I think before we even had the next meeting, she had called me to say, we've decided that we'd like to purchase the piano. Well, that was sort of our job <laughs> mostly done then. You know, I mean, as far as the committee, we had raised a certain amount uh, of money till then, um, you know, a, a very little, but um, had gotten some, uh, I, I've just forgotten, the, there were some concerts Oh, I, I've just forgotten the history. Is is back and this is back. We're talking. Two thousand ten was when the idea came right. to me that we needed this, 
2011 is when we really got going with the committee and, and meetings. And yeah, and in February sometime uh, of 2011, the piano was ordered. And uh, Roberta, we, we ordered it through the, uh, the uh, Vancouver uh, dealership and we're very excited about it then. And this preceded the idea of um, renovating Dark Hall. Like you guys were doing this independent. This, there were, these these yes. two projects weren't interlinked. No. No, no, it wasn't. In fact, um, yes, we, we had a, a, a meeting then in, in 2012 with uh, uh, Vianne Timmons, the president of the university, and uh, she and her husband came, came here to the house and we, we had a, a discussion about the piano. Vianne was very excited about the idea and uh, told us that she would certainly look into the possibility of accommodating it in Dark Hall at that time. That was the first time that that was... I mean, we had talked about the possibility of having it, uh, where to have it, and the logical place for all of us seemed to be Dark Hall, which particularly pleased Roberta, of course, because she had history as a girl performing in Dark Hall yeah. as a student, and, uh, uh, and many, uh, of course, many in the city... Uh, did that for years uh, when when the uh, well the conservatory is, is still attached there. Yeah, and she's right across the street. She's right across the street. Yes. Yeah. 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 How did you guys feel when when the project just all came together? Like it just everything just fell into place so perfectly. Yeah. As far as uh, from the idea's inception to the formation of the committee to the. Uh, purchase of the piano was a much briefer time than we had anticipated, and so of course we were delighted with that. We felt ecstatic. Yeah. <laughs> what at all we felt. Christine Vanderkoy, who was then uh, the uh, at the piano department at the University of Regina, uh, the professor there, um, was on the committee, and uh, she and I and the others, of course, were all excited that we had a had this great instrument coming. Then, then we were aware uh, there were there was talk at that time that Dark Hall uh, would would undergo some some changes, but we the piano came the piano arrived and it was moved in. I remember the day it came, it was flown from Italy to uh, Vancouver or Calgary and then uh, brought by truck I think from Calgary, and we were there when the truck arrived and brought it in the back uh, stage door of Dark Hall. And would it fit in the elevator? That was the big thing. Really? Uh, yeah, and uh, it did. And we managed it uh, up there and then got the legs put on it. Or maybe, I, I forget whether the, whether it came with the legs on. So so then we had the opportunity to play the piano for the first time, just uh, out of the box, as it were, literally, yeah. uh, just on, in the backstage area on the cement floor, which is a very live acoustic back there. Yeah. But both Christine and I played, and and we were. Tr I was begging Roberta, who was also there, to to try it. Roberta, yeah. this is this is the instrument that you have purchased for us. So she demurred, and didn't, <laughs> didn't actually play it at that time. So I, I'm not even sure if she has uh, played it uh, herself. But she was, of course, just ecstatic with it too. And from the first uh, playing of it, this this milky, fluid, buttery kind of feel with this instrument was just a delight and I loved playing it and for the first uh, uh, several years when we had the piano uh, unfortunately the Dark Hall shortly after it came or maybe I, I forget just when maybe it had shut down before but shortly after it came Dark Hall shut down to public events so in the, in those early years there were a few things that we had there there were a few concerts that we had it was like an inauguration of the piano at some point, and I remember Christine and I both played, and Lawrence Amondred, another pianist at the conservatory, uh, who teaches there, uh, played and uh, introduced the piano to, yeah. the, to the public. We also played it at Roberta's mother's funeral. She was saying, uh, yeah. yeah, and that was, uh, that was a lovely thing. I had gotten to know Roberta, I think, through... She had commissioned a piece for me for her mother's 95th birthday oh my God, a few years she before. Didn't tell me that. Yeah, she had commissioned a piece for me. And uh, so I had written this piano piece that was a set of variations called Faces. Uh -huh. And uh, the idea for, the, for that came from the, the fact that uh, 
everybody in Roberta's family seemed to have a connection to the piano. She, she, both she and her sister, Sheila, had taken lessons. Sheila was a piano teacher. Uh, Sheila's children played, took lessons, and now they had grandchildren playing. So I thought, I'd like to set a, write a set of variations that could be played as a team. <laughs> you know, oh, wow. some of the, the younger kids yeah. could play the simpler variations, some of the more experienced pianists could play the other, you know. Right. That was the idea in mind. I don't know if I've ever, they ever worked it out that way, but they, uh, anyways, I, I had, uh, had certainly played that in concert for, um, at a concert at which uh, me, uh, Roberta's mother, was, was in attendance. Nice. And so that was lovely. So that was, uh, uh, you know, when I knew Roberta loved pianos. Yeah. And that was... You talked about the, the sound of the piano. Would somebody who isn't like a concert pianist, would they be able to tell the difference between a Fazioli and a cheaper, like a Cassia? I don't know. Like a, well, I, a you know, I, I, it's hard to say. I, I mean, if you have a very... <laughs> If you have a very good ear, then, uh, you know, you might tell. But, I mean, those are usually musicians who have the yeah. ear, who are, who are trained to listen for those kind of nuances. Every, every piano is an individual, and every uh, make of piano is individual from other makes. Yeah. But within that make, there are many different individuals, too. Every piano is, is its own thing. Yeah. My two Yamahas are very different, uh, and I, I like that. Yeah. I like that, that there, you know. So, so getting to know your instrument is a is a a thing that pianists do all the time. Getting to know the instrument they're playing, because yeah. it's like a, a person, an individual, has its own voice. So the Fazioli, uh, what what I love about it is the clarity of sound. I mean, there are things that I love about the Yamaha sound. There are things I love about a Steinway sound. And the Fazioli, being only a piano that's uh, probably between 40 and 50 years old now. I mean, yeah. I think the factory, Mr. Fazioli, I, I'm not sure the dates of when he uh, started, that, but it's about that age, I think. So this is a relatively newcomer on the block, the Fazioli, but we've certainly heard uh, players like Angela Hewitt uh, do all her... Uh, recordings and everything with, with that, so we're, we're quite familiar with that sound now. And it's particularly wonderful for the music of Bach, which she, of course, is a specialist in. You're listening to Out of the Dark, a series about Regina's historic performance space, Dark Hall, on 91.3 FM CJTR, tuned into the community. The idea, th- this is something I haven't touched on, the idea for the piano why we wanted this was not just a piano for me or Christine or the committee. This was a piano. We called it the Piano for Regina Committee because the idea was that it would be a piano that would be accessible to pianists, really, of all ages and experience. So from, from the young student, uh, probably more geared towards an older student, but uh, certainly then also the uh, the... Uh, teachers and professionals in the in the city, as well as visiting artists, of course, that would right. be a huge attraction to to be able to play an instrument like that. That was that was our goal, and we we tried in those first years when the when the piano was at backstage in Dark Hall, we would have various groups come in, uh, small groups of students. Teachers would bring a few students in. That was that was exciting when we could do that. Uh, we, yeah. we were we were. Um, able to able to use the piano but uh rarely on stage although we brought it out i would take my students from the university i was teaching at the university at that time and i i uh, brought my students from the university over to play the piano uh, and we did our master class on stage in dark hall that was always the highlight for them they loved they loved that yeah and so that 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 is that's the essence of what we we wanted for the for the instrument so it's it's it hasn't come into full blossom yet because dark hall isn't open yet and that's that would be the the final thing when when dark hall is open and the piano is able to be used again and we can make arrangements for our vision of it being a piano for all pianists in the city who are serious pianists you know um, we we spent a lot of time with Michael Lipnicki in Calgary, who is the uh, uh, technician, piano technician in Calgary. Uh, work work that uh, been the technician for the Honens Festival and 
he guided us through the process of building the piano garage at the back of Dark Hall initially. And we had a special piano garage that was built for it that was humidified properly and everything stored in there. And then, of course, that all had to change when Dark Hall was being renovated. And so it's moved into its other other space in the conservatory now. Do you miss being able to like perform in Dark Hall? Oh, yes. Yes. That, that's, it's a wonderful space. It's a good size. It's not too big. And, uh, and yet it's big enough to give a sense of occasion. I mean, that is a big piano, and it certainly fills, uh, fills the space there. Yeah, this is a, this is a 92 key piano. Most pianos are 88. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. This is a bigger piano. The added notes are on the bottom end. And they, they do make uh, a larger piano than that, which has 96 keys, I think, four right. more keys. I did not know that about the Fascioli. Uh, who writes music that needs those extra bass notes? Not very many people, yeah. <laughs> because there's not many pianos that have that. Yeah. But uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily just that those notes are available to be played as, as, as notes in a piece. They, they give added resonance to the, to the overall piano, particularly the bass. Really? Yeah. Why, why the piano has its special sound is when you, when you play one string and hold the pedal down, all the strings vibrate. You only hear the pitch of the one string that you're hearing, right. and it's overtones. But those overtones are supported by all these other strings. Yeah, it, it's a. It, I mean, it's just a, an acoustic dream. The piano is really one of the great inventions of, of, uh, of the world. I would say, right. uh, in terms of the number of parts put together and and how it's evolved over the years to, to become such a magnificent thing. And pianos really are, they're making the best pianos now they've ever made, uh, even though there's lots of other electronic instruments and, and that that have come to, to try to usurp and have in many cases usurped the piano, but nothing replaces the piano. When, whenever I can possibly help, I refuse to play on an electronic instrument. I said, if you have an old battered upright, let me play that. I'll play that before an electronic instrument. Because it's just so... A any piano is susceptible to the touch of a pianist. And that means it communicates emotion and, and subtlety of nuance in a way that an electronic instrument d doesn't. I mean, they've improved electronic instruments and made, made more changes, but... It's just, it's this much improvement compared to the piano. It's, yeah. it's, it's not even in the ballpark. I, I uh, play, I, I'm the organist, uh, and, and we also, I also play piano at St. Paul's Cathedral. Okay. Uh, and we have uh, a small grand. Yeah. Uh, it's a, a young Chang. It's, it's fine. Yeah. They're not superior instruments by any means, but yeah. they're fine. But you can create magic on it, even when you know that, oh, it's not perfectly in tune today. Yeah. Very few days it is perfectly in tune. Yeah. But it has qualities. It has a warmth. It has yeah. a brilliance. And if you know how to approach it right, you can make it sound ugly easily. Yeah. But if you approach it with, with great care and a careful ear, it can produce magical sounds. And so times 100 with the Fazioli. What does it feel like? What is, what is the touch? Oh, I, 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 you know, I feel like I've had a glass of wine after playing that Fazioli. Really? You know how you're kind of elevated, you have a glass of wine, you're just enough to kind of, yeah. you know, you feel like you're floating a bit, not quite walking on the ground. Yeah. That's how it feels to play the Fazioli. I, I've also thought it, uh, it feels buttery. <laughs> I don't know. That's an, uh, not a word I've ever used with any other piano that I can think of, but uh, it, the way you can produce legato on the instrument, you know, the connecting the sounds uh, is uh, the way the sounds, notes melt into each other. You know, you, you, you have to find a new vocabulary to talk about music when you're talking about the Fazioli. How do you think you can best sort of like communicate that idea to Regina that this was, that this, that, that bringing this piano here is a great thing for everybody? Well, I think, uh, number one, it would largely speak for itself when, when people had a chance to play it. They would see the value in, you know, teachers bringing their students to, to play it. They would see the value in, in what the 
you know, the more you hear, the more you you think is possible. And so you you push the envelope a, a little bit. And uh, I think that's that's one one thing. So the piano will certainly uh, sell itself in that sense. We we do need to um, uh, think, and you know, the years have gone by, and this dark hall business has been painfully slow. And so I, I feel badly because, in a sense, I feel we're missing out on the best years of this piano's life. Pianos can last a very long time, but uh, these are important years for it to be played and to be uh, as it as it matures. The instrument itself uh, does a certain amount of maturing over time and by being played. So we do need to do some more thinking about how we can let the piano fulfill the the, the ideal that it was that it was uh, purchased for, and that would be. Uh, inspiring pianists from, from young to old to make beautiful music. I spent the next several minutes listening intently to David's notes and suggestions, scribbling away in my notebook and marking ideas directly on the score. Afterward, as I sat there listening to my classmates take their turns on the piano, I found I couldn't focus on their performances. Instead, my mind fixated on my experience from a few moments before and the freedom that had accompanied it. Is this how it felt to truly be one with the music and with myself? to have realized a potential existed that wasn't there before, and to be able to embrace it in its full authenticity? To touch something sublime? I wondered if without the Fazioli, would I ever be able to play this well again? I smiled to myself, knowing that I would, because now I knew that I could. That was the gift of the Fazioli. But it wasn't where or what I expected it to be. I didn't expect an otherwise boring day in a gray month to change my life, but it did. Something finally clicked in my brain as I realized that I didn't need the big accomplishments as much as I needed these small victories, these seemingly insignificant but special moments. Maybe I didn't need to be perfect to be happy or successful after all. For a while now, I've been questioning my self-worth, self-confidence, and my right to be in my Bachelor of Music program. There were much more proficient musicians here, playing more difficult music, learning it faster, and playing it better than I could ever hope but how could that matter when I just had such a transcending experience? It didn't. In the end, it didn't matter that I wasn't the best. It only mattered that I was making music. And sitting on the empty stage, the bright stage lights beating down on me and the smell of history in my lungs, I knew that I was in the right place. I was a part of this world as much as the great musicians selling out Carnegie Hall and as much as the tiny children learning the notes for the first time next door. I had earned my right. I may never again play an instrument as magnificent as the Fazioli. I may never fill large audiences, and there may come a far-off day after my degree where I spend my days in an office before a computer keyboard rather than a piano keyboard. But as long as I keep this moment alive and recreate it as often as I can, that's all I need out of my craft. All I needed to earn my right to music was to love it. A few weeks later, sitting in one of the plush red seats in the audience waiting for the Fazioli's dedication concert to begin, I thought that was something that Dr. Roberta McKay and Mr. Elmer Brenner perhaps understood. I believe they wanted to share the marvelous gift of music with the city, with anyone who wishes to enjoy it, to create memorable and transcending moments exactly like the one that I had experienced. This suspicion was confirmed when they were welcomed on stage to speak at the opening of the concert and explained that they donated the Fazioli in order to give students the opportunity to play a high quality instrument. I was a little shocked. It was all for me and others just like me. A smile formed on my face and the warmth spread to my chest as I realized that someone I'd never met in my entire life cared so deeply about me, a stranger. I clapped as loudly as I could. Though I have not laid hands on the Fazioli for several years, my moments with her live in my memory as a testament to the wonder and magic of Dark Hall and the passionate artists who create music within its historic walls, be they the greats or the everyday artists. More than that, it is a reminder of the wonder and magic of life. Perhaps one day, Fazioli and I will meet again.
Huge thanks to Roberta McKay, Elmer Brenner, and David McIntyre for sharing their stories about the Fazioli piano and Dark Hall. And of course, a gigantic thank you to Jamie Crowser for her story about the Fazioli and for performing Scriabin's Preludes No. 10 and No. 14. Jamie hadn't played those songs in a very long time, and I had kind of ambushed her, asking her to perform them for me. Thanks for going out on a musical limb there, Jamie. You've been listening to Out of the Dark, an exploration of Dark Hall through stories. This series was made possible thanks to the generous support of Sask Arts and the University of Regina Conservatory of Performing Arts. Dark Hall is situated in Treaty 4 territory, the traditional home of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Makeshift Nation. Music for Out of the Dark is from Mozart's Dissonance Quartet, 465, and performed by Christian Robinson and Hang Han Ho on violins, Jonathan Ward on viola, and Simon Fryer on cello. They are Regina Symphony Orchestra performers. I'm your host, Paul Deshane. Thank you for listening. <laughs>